on the four GT teams kind of re reunion for us. There were about 30 key team members. Uh, we've gotten probably a third of the team together here today. I want to introduce them. Uh, and it's sort of a reunion for us, as I said. So we'll start out with number one, chief engineer on the 4GT program, Mr. Fred Good now. Fred, come on up. Now, now come on, I'll help you, Freddie. He's, he's getting a little on in his years, you know? But I got it, he's as mean as ever. Now, Freddie has the distinction of being the engineer that worked on every stillborn Ford GT, Ford, mid-engine Ford product until we got him assigned to the Ford GT. So he's a wealth of knowledge and not short of opinions. And uh, we love Freddie dearly. Number two up is Kurt Hill, who managed the entire powertrain in the Ford GT program. Incredible motor, as you know. In fact, I'll tell this story. It's the only powertrain program I've ever been involved with on a ground-up powertrain. We only had one engine failure, and that was on a, a crankshaft using the carryover part of the Ford truck where we had uh, the oil pump drive, which we don't use on the Ford GT. The notch was there. We took that notch out. You know the car, those motors are now capable of well over 1,000 horsepower. There's the man behind it, he did the job. Number three, Mr. Bill Clark. Come on up, Mr. Bill. Now Bill was in charge of the body, all the new materials, in fact, several of the patents. No, 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 over here, Bill, over here. We're doing this in order. There's method to the madness, and including, I think there were five or six patents on the 4GT, many of them having to do with the new materials and technology that were used. I'm going to pause here for a second. When Neil Ressler and I, and I believe Carol Shelby was with us, when we kicked off the team at the kickoff meeting, program approval, we said, this is a lifetime opportunity, once in a lifetime opportunity. It's never going to happen again. Uh, the next three I will introduce have had the experience of it happening again. So first up is going to be Mark McGowan. He's one of Ford's, I call him Mark the Stig McGowan because he's one of our hot shoes, responsible for development of Ford GT, and he's had a, a little bit of time to play in the new car as well. <laughs> our late entrance is in the back. Jamal Hamidi was program manager on uh, the Ford GT program. And uh, I'm going to show some photos later I may actually edit, uh, editorialize a bit on when you see, uh, when you see Jamal. I'll have a little slideshow later. But Jamal is heavily involved in the new program. And our special guest appearance for taking 4GT to the next level beyond all our dreams and expectations Global Head of Product Development of Ford Motor Company. Humble guy, he doesn't want to admit, but really important in the development and getting the 4GT here out in front, but more importantly, getting us a classic Le Mans win again 50 years later. Mr. Raj Nair. Raj, come on up. So I'm going to lead off with, uh, tee off with a couple of questions for each guy, and we'll just run down the list, and then uh, we'll backtrack a little bit, we'll transition a little bit to the new 4GT, because I know some of you are gonna be interested about that, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. But the question is, are this, two-part question. Freddie, what was the most significant moment, most memorable moment in the development of the 4GT, and what did you see the biggest challenge? And then each of you just give us your recollections as we go down the road and you'll have to pass mics as we get to the end. Go ahead, Freddie. Well, the, the best memory for me was uh, the uh, 2003, the uh, introduction out of Laguna Seca. I mean, I didn't think we'd get to that point, but when we had the press introduction out there with all the press and uh, the worldwide introduction out there with uh, 
race car drivers and press and the team was out there. I mean, it, it was great. I mean, that, that, that was uh, really the official kickoff of the, of the uh, program and uh, that, was a, that was a huge memory for me personally. And uh, the second question, uh, the, the biggest challenge was, uh, I mean, I, I knew that the team, because we, we had the best in the company, inside and outside the company, working on the program, so that I knew that each one of the systems and each one of the parts on the car was going to be there, because we had the best engineers uh, available working on it, so I knew the parts were going to get there. But the biggest challenge was getting all the parts in that car. I mean, the car was a little bit bigger, quite a bit bigger than the original car, but there was more parts in that car than that original race car. So it was, it was the biggest challenge was 10 pounds in a five pound box, and especially inside the cabin. I mean, if you saw what was under that dash, you, you say there was no way that we were gonna get all that stuff with all the safety things that had to go in that car and that. Uh, so that to me was the biggest challenge. I knew the parts were going to be there and they would meet all the engineering criteria because we had the guys to do it. But uh, getting everything in that car, that was the challenge. So. Thanks, Freddie. And by the way, Dan Gurney was one of the guys out at Laguna Seca driving the cars. Of course, we had uh, Jay Leno entertaining the, the press at the time as well. It was a good memory. Kurt? Yeah, yeah, it works. Um, the crankshaft brings back memories that, that Chris mentioned, and uh, we were trying to get through our key durability test on the engine, which is 300 hours of running 45% of that 300 at peak torque, 45% at peak power, and then 10% overspeed. It's a grueling test. 300 hours, when you start going through your actual efficiency on a dynamometer, takes four to five weeks. So you're on pins and needles for, for quite a period of time. The, uh, the crankshaft failure actually occurred at about 125 hours um, in. And I happened to be out of the dynamometer building that day with my counterpart at Roush, Greg White, and we were in a conference room going through some things, and a, a guy poked his head in the room who I didn't know at the time, later I found out was, was JC, who we became pretty good friends with, but he uh, pokes his head in and in, in somewhat of a smart aleck way he said, is that your engine in, in cell D out there, the one that just blew up? And uh, I looked at Greg and I said, are we in cell D? And he said, yeah, because I didn't know the cell numbers at that at the time. We go out there and here's the fire department. The Bonia Fire Department is in. The water, the sprinklers are going off everywhere. They've got their jackets on. We see a damper in the front end of the crankshaft sitting over in the corner of a dyno cell, kind of sneak underneath their yellow jackets, grab the part, and head it out. So a week later, we had a new crankshaft in place um, in the next engine, and we went at it again. Um, the, and, which led to the most memorable moment. It was June 12, 2003. It was the first day of the centennial. And we passed that test, hit the 300-hour mark at about 5 a.m. And I got the phone call, and it was like having my first kid. It was just great. So challenge-wise, um, that was a big challenge getting through that test, but probably at, at a component level, the cylinder block um, was, was an all-new um, aluminum block that didn't share a whole lot other than bore and stroke um, with the, uh, the architecture that it, that it came from. And it, we had a, a, a great team on it. We had some support from the Ford mainstream casting people to help us through it. The toughest thing is getting that done inside of about 18 months um, because with casting, there's porosity issues and other things you have to deal with. And uh, it, was, it was pretty grueling, but we got it there. Those that you would have that car, that block is literally indestructible, and we're pretty proud of it. So that was, uh, that was one of the challenges among many, but thanks. Thanks, Kurt, great job. Bill? Okay, probably the greatest challenge in the body area was getting those side windows to open on the doors. <laughs> um, the concept car had the, you know, a GT40, the, the windows are leaned in quite a bit and the door itself has that big deep pocketed area for air to reach the scoop behind the door. So we talked about you know flip windows and the little slider that you could reach out to get your tickets and your tacos, but nobody wanted to do that stuff. So we had to figure out a way to make this, this, this window open like a real car would. And uh, we had a couple of really good CAD designers who just kept pushing that surface, a little more radius on the glass, pushing in a little more, uh, working with, with Camillo in the studio to try to push that surface of the door a little bit this way, a little that way, enough to make him uncomfortable and nervous. And <laughs> but eventually we got to a point where the animation in CAD showed, okay, it drops, it works. And uh, 
remember the meeting in the studio that day and everybody kind of blessed it and said, okay, we're good, let's go. There's some smiles and uh, I was pretty much terrified because <laughs> I looked at it and saw these real thin moldings. It was gonna have to be a die casting and we didn't know how we were gonna attach it yet. We didn't know how, who was gonna make it and how we we're gonna make it reliable and keep out wind noise and water leaks and all that stuff that people expect from a car. <laughs> And uh, so it was, it was still a long road after that. It was, you know, trying to get everything to dial in and be able to build it. I mean, we were only building nine cars a day, but still had to be able to put it together pretty quickly. And uh, so it was a great challenge, but we, we eventually got there, so. Uh, most memorable. Most memorable. Uh, two things, I think, uh, I think it was fun for all of us to get to meet a lot of the legends from the GT40s from the 60s, and they came around to lend inspiration. And for me personally, it was very early in the program before I really met any of them, and uh, I had a voicemail on my phone, and it was, hello, Bill, this is Carol Shelby calling. Just wanted to call you and talk, and I have, think I have some ideas for you. So as a kid who grew up reading about him, I was, I was floored that day. So I uh, called him back, and we, he had some ideas, and I don't remember what I said to him. It was probably silly. But <laughs> and then later on, you know, Fred mentioned when we got to introduce the cars out in California to the media, and, we were at Laguna Seca one day, and, and Danny, Dan Gurney was there, and he was uh, giving hot laps. And uh, it was meant for uh, key dealers and, and media, but I, I snuck a ride in there and <laughs> got to ride with uh, Dan Gurney on, uh, at Laguna Seca. And even at 72, he was, I was uh, really thrilled with the ride he gave. It was very fast. So, so that, was, that was probably one of my most special moments. Thanks, Bill. Mark? Most memorable moment. Um, I was lucky enough to be sent to Italy, a place called Nardo. Uh, it's a 7.8 miles perfect circle on the Aegean Sea. And for 10 days, we basically ran two GTs at VMAX. So you basically circulated this track, flat foot and fifth gear. Uh, the car won't pull um, top speed in six. And that basically was a day in the office where you would go 207 to 209 miles an hour all day long. You could go five laps. It would do 18 gallons of gasoline in about 16 minutes. You couldn't make the sixth lap because you would run out of gas. It was one of the few times you could actually see the gas gauge go down while you're driving. Um, and one caveat, the cars were restricted to 205 miles an hour. And the first time we ever got to 205 was at Nardo in total blackness. It was about midnight. Uh, I can guarantee you I was overdriving the headlights. <laughs> Most uh, challenge, probably the tires. Um, Goodyear was our supplier, but they were very reluctant to make change. And if you know how the tire submission business works, they basically supply you three prototype tire construction and compound at a time. And you get to about the, and they're alphabetized, and you get about halfway through the alphabet when you finally uh, freeze the tire. Well, on the GT program, we went through the alphabet twice. But to their credit, when we finished, we did have a tire that was capable of sustaining speed of 200 miles an hour, good in the wet. We even tested it in the snow. I personally have driven my car in the snow. <laughs> it actually is pretty decent, but not recommended. All right, next up, Jamal. Uh, biggest challenge, I would say, was uh, more of a human challenge more so than a technical challenge, and that was uh, you know, like, like you said, Chris, we were, a, we were a little team of about 30 people. Uh, many of us had very vibrant personalities. And uh, just keeping the team together, working together, marching towards the end goal, uh, despite crazy deadlines, uh, you know, things are happening every day. Uh, things pop up, you fix one thing and another thing pops up. And uh, re so really just, that was, that was the biggest challenge for me. And, and knowing when, uh, you know, our team was kind of outside of the main Ford system, but we were uh, somewhat in as well, and knowing when to, uh, 
utilize the vast resources of Ford Motor Company and, and all the technology and knowledge that it holds and then knowing when to, to go off on your own and uh, do our own thing. That was, uh, that, that was challenging. I mean, we, we had never done that before and so we were kind of writing the, writing the book on how to do that. So that was, that was interesting. Uh, memorable for me was one moment at the Centennial when, uh, when it was right outside of Henry Ford Museum and uh, it was the blue car, I think, one of the Centennial blue cars that uh, Dan Gurney came in and, and sat in the car for the first time and uh, just, just like the look on his face. And I think someone captured an amazing photo of him sitting in that car and just like the, I mean, you could just see how proud he was of, of the original car and, and this, you know, the 2005 car. And I mean, he just had like this unbelievable smile on his face. You, he didn't have to say a word. You just saw it on his face. I thought that was, that's a memory that, you know, I'll remember always. Thanks, Jamal. Um, well, I, I came on later in the program than, than the rest of the team, so all these guys had everything figured out by the time I was on the program. But uh, I think the, the challenge um, was similar to what Jamal said. You know, you know Ford is used to, used to developing vehicles um, and proving them out on, on vehicles that are going to be built at you know, 50 jobs an hour, right? Every hour, 50 units come off the end of the line, and there's a whole bunch of processes and tests and standards you have to meet to be able to repeatedly have a vehicle go together at you know, one every minute. And, um, and so building one at, at 50 a week or 45 a week um, required a really different mindset. So a lot of the biggest challenge was exactly what you said, figuring out what parts of the process applied and which of them didn't. And particularly for people who had a different opinion, to be honest, a lot of my job was providing air cover <laughs> for the team so they didn't have to do some of that stuff. Um, so that was, I think, the biggest challenge, and, and particularly figuring out what we were going to be doing between Celine and, and Wixom. And Wixom was obviously the mainstream Ford plant, and so a lot of that stuff, figuring out what was the right balance uh, and managing, as Jamal said, a lot of personalities. <laughs> um, I think the most memorable moment, other than job one, which was always a memorable moment, um, when you know, that first production saleable vehicle comes off the end of the line. I think the sign-off drive, um, I still think that was like the best sign-off drive in history when we drove from Los Angeles to, to Las Vegas and um, there's so many moments there, um, you know, hoping Jamal wasn't going to puke in the passenger seat and um, and I remember when we were up in, I think it was, was it Dante's Peak that Dante's we were up at, Peak, the, at yep. the top of? and. No, I'm not going to talk about that. If oh, someone wants to talk gonna, to me. We're going to show it. Are we going to show it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were up at the top of the canyon. We had four cars, and we were just parked up there for a break, and we are going to take a, a picture up there. And I still have the picture of us, actually, in my garage. But while we were up there, this F-18 comes flying by above us. And then he came back again. So he clearly saw us up there and wanted to see what we were. And then we, we thought he was gone. And then the next thing we know, this guy comes down, he's in the canyon, we're looking down at him, and full afterburner, and he just wanted to show us what real horsepower was about. <laughs> um, and so that was, uh, that was a great moment, and still, um, uh, I'll never forget that drive, and it's certainly one of the highlights of my career. Yep, and we're gonna show you those photos, too. All right, before, um, before we switch gears, uh, let me introduce the other team members because I want you to know them, what they do, and, and what they did. And uh, you'll be able to ask them questions as well. So we'll start out with you, Randy. We'll just pass it around. Randy Bedke, I did the instrument cluster, all the instrumentation systems. Next, Glenn Miller. I'm Glenn Miller. I was pretty much the driveline, the, the gearbox, um, half shafts, and uh, some of the cooling bundles. Hi, Bob Brown. I was, uh, I think I was called quality manager. I guess I managed the quality. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
See, did I miss anybody? I know we had a couple of late entrants. Anybody else? Okay. Now we'll switch gears a little bit. Uh, let me get a toss-up question first on the, on the new GT, but maybe this is best for Raj. How did the new one happen? And tell us about the decision to go to Le Mans, too, because that was my lifelong dream. He got to live it, and I love it. <laughs> How did the new one happen? Um, certainly an aspect of stubbornness to the point of stupidity. Um, um, well, I, I think it was, you know, similar to um, the 0506, where the original um, concept that you guys came up with was to celebrate the centennial of the company when we showed the car. Um, we, we knew the 50th anniversary of the win in 66 was coming up, and we wanted to, you know, figure out a way to, to celebrate that. And I think if we're honest, it was a, a se sequence of ideas on how we were going to do that. At the time, we were in development of the Mustang, and it was going to be the 50th anniversary of, of the Mustang um, a year and a half prior to that. And we thought, well, maybe we should make it kind of like a double 50th, and we should go race the Mustang. And as we investigated racing the Mustang in um, the GTLM or GTE series, it, it's a big car. And so um, we were really working through how are we, how are we going to do that, and then finally we figured out we're actually, to be competitive, we'd have to really do a homologation special. And so we, we actually came up with um, and a concept, which was a carbon fiber bodied Mustang. Um, and, and so it was, it was, you know, just a pure race car that we were going to, you know, sell the minimum amount and, um, as, as a production car. And, uh, you know, for a bunch of reasons, um, it, it didn't generate a lot of traction. We learned a lot about the engineering, uh, but it didn't generate a lot of traction. It actually went all the way up um, to a meeting, um, you know, at the highest levels. It didn't go to the board, but it went to the highest levels in the company, just below the board. And um, it was rejected. Um, and so, to be honest, I was a little pissed off about that. Um, but I think it's the best thing that could have happened, because then we looked at some of the technology we had um, started working on for the carbon fiber Mustang and looking at it. And we'd always been thinking about when could we do another GT. And, and as you know, the investment to do um, even something at, at 50 a week is pretty high. You're still into production tools. And, and Freddie, I know, you know we had that discussion about how much prototype could we use. And it ended up being a lot of production tools. And those are expensive. But as we looked at this homologation special, we realized we could really do a lot of this stuff for low investment. And also, the quality of prototype tooling is really almost as good, if not better, than production tooling now. So we, we kind of looked at that and said, well, maybe we could do a GT. Um, and this is fresh off of the project being rejected. So we weren't really supposed to be working on anything. <laughs> um, and so we started with a small group converting the project to what would a GT be? Um, and um, it was much more about doing the production car and the race car at the same time versus the Mustang proposal was really doing the race car and then doing the minimum required to get it to production. Um, this was very much so doing uh, race car and road car at the same time. Um, and it was a little behind the timing we would have liked to have. Like I said, we would have probably liked to have had a year of racing under our belt before going back in 66 for the 50th anniversary with one shot to uh, celebrate it correctly, but you know, thanks to uh, you know a fantastic team on all fronts: the guys for the road car, the guys for the race car, the the, the Roush Yates guys, the engine guys, everybody. Right? Um, we were fortunate enough to celebrate the anniversary correctly and, and winning. So that's a little bit of the background. Thanks, Raj. Um, Mark, you spent a little time. Jamal, you were obviously involved with the new car as well, and Raj. Um, Maybe you can answer two questions. Uh, what, did, what did you learn, if anything, from the 4GT that you carried over into the new 4GT development? And what's different? What, what had to be new and different in, in the process uh, of developing the new car versus the old car? So, Mark, why don't you start out? And well, I'm, well, in the new car, I have very little experience in the new car, to be um, 
I've done a little little driving of the new car. I can give you a, what the old car versus the new car drives like, and it's amazing. A couple decades, entire technology, a vehicle that's shedded another 500 pounds of weight, a car that's got even more horsepower on a smaller motor, superior aero. It's it's technology just moves so fast, and the new car, while they they share similarities in, in parts and the looks. Uh, the new car is just amazingly so so more capable than the 05, 06 cars. Unfortunately, I don't fit in it. <laughs> but it's funny it fits Raj. <laughs> <laughs> what is the row pipe though? 39. But yeah, uh, very limited time in the new car. Okay. Let's let's hear from Jamal. Uh, what was the question again? Uh, what 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 have we learned? What are we learning? We're learning every day still. Uh, we've uh, you know the one thing that that I carry over from the last GT to the new GT is uh, you know you you can't be risk averse when uh, when choosing architectures, choosing uh, technology, things like that. There's so much new technology in, in the new car. And, uh, you know, there, it's, you just have to manage all of that risk. And if you think about all of the things that could go wrong on any given day, it would, you know, you'd, you'd go jump off a cliff or something. So it's managing all that risk and, and uh, keeping engineers from panicking uh, on a daily basis, and uh, it was, uh, you know, that's, um, that, that to me is, is the biggest common thing from the old program to the new program. Raj? Yeah, I, I think the biggest um, common thing um, is, you know, we, we saw with, the, with, with you guys in the 05 team what a what small team can do um, but still leverage big Ford for the right things. And, and so, you know, watching how the 0506 team did that really well. Um, I don't know if that means we gotta leave or, um, it's, it's certainly something that we re reproduce for this car and, and having the right balance of, um, the right small empowered team, you know, the best guys, the cream of the crop. Um, but also being able to leverage big Ford when we need to for, you know, all the skills and resources that, that Ford Motor Company can bring to bear uh, when it wants to do something. Um, I think the biggest difference um, in, in developing the two was this one was really, it, it had a goal in mind, um, which was to win in 2016 at Le Mans. And, and so, what we needed as the basis for the, the, the GT race car was always at the heart of what we were doing for designing the production car. We knew we had to do a great production car. We, we knew we had a lot to live up to um, from the 05 and 06. We, we had a lot to live up to in the racing pedigree of the GT40. Um, and so balancing both of those was um, the biggest difference because we always knew from the very beginning we were going to race it. And, and so many of the decisions were based on we need to do this for the race car, so we need to figure out how to, how to make it work for the production car. Uh, let me backtrack for a second. Uh, both cars have to go through. We talked about the, I think it was Mark that talked about the, the test standards that are required. And just one sticks in my mind that uh, we always had to negotiate what passenger car standards we had to pass. So we've got a splitter on the 4GT, the new 4GT's got a splitter. And we had uh, at least one person insisting that you had to pass the water trough test, which is literally taking a 4GT into a water bath. Well, I can't remember how many inches deep it was at five miles an hour and managed to not knock off the, uh, off the splitter. But those are the kind of challenges you know, the guys had to, had to go through. Now, go back to the new GT. What did it feel like? Well, first, let me say this. For those of you who don't know, it's unprecedented to go to Le Mans, 
your first year on a short, short time schedule and win. The original four GT took three years. Now on the Viper team, it took us three years. Corvette team took them two years. Um, many other manufacturers all tried and failed first time out. Big challenge, big guts to go out there and say we're gonna do it. And then to accomplishment, you need to understand what a fantastic accomplishment it is. How'd it feel, Raj, and how nervous were you when it, all, when it was all going down? Um, I mean, we've been so close to the project, right? So you've been working on it and, um, you know, the lead up and all the, the issues leading up to it. I, I gotta say, leading up to 24 hours of Daytona, we were feeling pretty good. Uh, we knew from the testing we had a pretty good car and we were actually pretty clean reliability testing. Um, and then came 24 hours of Daytona, and, and, um, and the car was not reliable. I mean, it was, um, she was beautiful and she was fast, but she was temperamental. Um, and so that was a wake-up call for us. And then, you know, leading up to it, for those of you who don't understand the series, you know, the series organizers try to get all the cars up to the same speed. So it's an exciting race, and everybody's running the same lap times. But the cars are so different, it's, it's hard to do that. And our car, as I said, was designed from the beginning to race. Uh, it wasn't converting a road car. And so leading up to Le Mans, you know, four separate times, uh, the organizers, even though that we weren't winning, saw the speed of the car and four separate times either added weight or reduced boost. And so by the, the end of it, we were so far down on the boost curve. We had the waste gates wide open and we were running naturally aspirated a little bit. So um, f from starting off from a very light car to racing at Daytona, and I don't know if people realize, but we, by the time all the ballast and boost came out, we had the, the heaviest car with the least amount of horsepower in the class. And, and that's how good the base car is. Um, but it's 24 hours, as you saw from Toyota. Um, you can lose all the way up to the very last lap, three minutes from the end of the race to the Toyota. Leading Toyota broke down. And I, I got to say, probably the last hour in the garage, you know, racers know that, but there's a lot of people in the garage that maybe aren't familiar with that. So uh, when you're standing there and, um, you know, Bill Ford is on one side and Edsel Ford's on the other and Mark Fields is behind you, and, and to be honest, they're being a little too happy, <laughs> and you're trying to settle them down. And then the Toyota breaks down, and all of a sudden our garage goes really quiet because th then everybody knows anything can happen. And then on the final lap, when the car goes by, then, then you can breathe. And, and obviously, it was a great celebration. For me personally, I, I don't think I really realized that um, until the flight home. I you know, got on the, the plane Monday and, and basically just slept because I was up you know, to 24 hours and, and the party beyond. Um, and then I woke up, and I know, you know I was there, and Dave Parasak was on the plane. And, Mark Rushbrook was on the plane, guys, you know, in Ford performance, and it was weird. I think we all just kind of woke up at the same time, and we looked at each other and just said, you know, did we just win Le Mans? <laughs> so, so, yeah, winning on your first year, um, we knew we had a good car, but nobody wins the first year of an all-new car that's not even in production yet, um, and an all-new team, all-new drivers, everybody learning how to work together. That's just, it just doesn't happen. I had my speech ready to go, saying, hey, GT40 took three years, right? Um, 64 and 65 were not good years for the GT40. Not a single GT40 finished the race those two years. It's the third year to one. So, you know, I had that speech ready to go. The speech for victory was not nearly as eloquent because I didn't think <laughs> I'd be using it, <laughs> um, to be honest. But um, it just shows when you've got the right people, the right partners, and, and you give them the room to do their job that uh, the team can do amazing things. Okay, before, oh, go ahead, Jamal. Just, just a quick comment. Um, that whole Le Mans weekend, I've, I've never been more proud to be an employee of Ford Motor Company than that weekend. I mean, everything that whole weekend, just the preparation, the racing team, the organization, the cars, everything just worked like clockwork. Um, and it's, it just kind of exemplified this is this is what Ford Motor Company can do uh, against the 
the best competition in the world. And it, it was just one of those, one of those things where I was like, wow, Ford is an amazing company. Congratulations. Now, before we open it up for questions, let, let me run down. What's on your mind, Guy? What, what, do you, what story do you want to tell, Freddie? You've got to tell a story. Each one of you. Come on. You've never been at a loss for words. You're going to stare me down. Great. Yeah, one, it came back to memory when Bell was talking about out of Laguna Seca for the media event. And Dan, they had a, an original GT40 there that Jackie Stewart was given drives in, and there was a couple, I think, of the new, well, we had the three um, anniversary cars out there, and um, they had a couple of Ferrari Modenas sitting there, too, and some other cars drive around, and everybody was wanting to ride in the GTs and the GT40 and all that. Um, but the Modenas were just sitting there. So we'd take those out and have a little fun. Then Dan Gurney was without anybody to take for hot laps, so we'd start going hot laps with, with Dan Gurney. And I was on one trip around with him, and th there was a rule you couldn't pass. And they'd try to let the cars out, you know, and, and space them out far enough so that wasn't too much of a problem. But Gurney caught up with Jackie Stewart in the, in the old Ford GT, or GT40, and passes him. And, Jackie Stewart looked over and he had the funniest look on his face and it was like, you're cheating, you're not supposed to do that. And Gurney looked out the window, lifted up his arm and gave him the finger. And, <laughs> and I just, it, it was a great moment. And, and somehow, somehow I thought they'd both been in that same situation before. It was, it was, it was precious. Bill? I'm not gonna force you, volunteer guys. Well, let's see. I think uh, maybe another one of our challenges was uh, f figuring out how to make this car compliant with all the regulations to put it on the road, you know, the 05 and 06 car, and uh, nobody wanted to put a bumper on the back of the car. <laughs> and we, we tried and tried and tried, and, you know, can we make the top of the ducktail into a bumper? And, <laughs> no, nope, it's too high. It doesn't, me doesn't meet the regs. And there just was no way around it, so we had to put a bumper on the car. And... Uh, and Camillo and Wolfgang at the time in the studio, they came up with the design. It's like, wow, I guess if we have to do it, it, it actually looks right. It looks like a, a real car kind of back there. And so that was a painful decision, I think, for a lot of us. We didn't want to do it. Yeah, I insisted it be easily removable for all the guys. <laughs> and uh, then the lawyers got a hold of it. And so it's not so easily <laughs> removable, but many of the owners do do it. Freddie's got a story now. His wheels are working. Go ahead, Fred. Yeah, I'll never forget this one. Um, I think everybody remembers it was fairly early in the production program. We uh, it hit the press, so it's not a secret. But there was a problem with the upper control arm on the uh, suspension, and uh, they took the car out of production. I mean, it's not very often that uh, a manufacturer will come out and issue a do not drive bulletin. Well, that happened on the GT, and. Uh, it was such an important car that they issued a do not drive bulletin and um, which means that uh, they had to notify all the uh, owners that had those early cars uh, do not drive and one thing led to another and it turned out that John Shirley number two at Microsoft the president of Microsoft was having a uh, special event at Laguna Seca that weekend with all his rich friends and that weekend, he had his car at Laguna Seca. Well, I got a call from somebody. I don't know if it was Chris or Coletti or somebody. They said, Fred, you're elected. You got to call John Shirley <laughs> and tell him that he has to shut down the Laguna Seca track. I don't know how many million it costs to rent the place and all his rich friends and tell him that he can't drive the car. I said, why me? <laughs> well, we took a vote and you're elected. <laughs> so. I said, well, isn't that sweet, <laughs> you know? He's not gonna know me from Mickey Mouse. So anyway, I called the guy, I was nervous. It's, I don't get nervous very easily, but I was nervous about calling this guy. And I called him, they paged him. The first couple of minutes were tense, to say the least. 
and I explained to him, and um, he was a little unnerved about having a problem with the car, and after I explained to him, he really appreciated that we were doing this. I mean, he understood the gravity, and after he got over that, he, he thought that was a good thing to do and all that, and all, all's well that ended well, and, and I said, okay, now you're gonna tell your friends that have their cars there to not to drive them, right? And, uh, and then we got back to them, and I forget what all we did. We did something, we did another event. The PR guys and the marketing guys did something really special for this guy. I mean, this guy was the president of Microsoft. You're not gonna send him a, uh, five coupons to go to Denny's restaurant. I mean, uh, we we did some we did something for him, but uh, uh, that I never had to make that kind of a call before. So it was. Uh, th that, I guess that's something I'll never forget. But anyway. Anything else, guys? Now let's bring the other team members up. We'll open up for questions. I know we're running over, so uh, but we'll answer any questions and we'll be around for you. Come on up, guys. Alex, I th somehow I don't think we introduced you. Come on up, stand up. Come on up here. You guys are bashful. Who has a question? By the way, thanks, guys. Great job on the car and great job on the new car. <laughs> Any questions from the team? They know the answers. We covered it all? Well, if you watch the video, you'll, okay. If you watch the video, you'll see that F-18, and you'll also see, yeah, it's coming. And then you'll see at the top of Dante's Peak, you'll see where Jamal was standing. And we went to take the group team photo, and all of a sudden, Jamal disappeared, and I ran to the edge of the cliff because I thought he'd fallen off. <laughs> but he'd, uh, he'd, He'd been imbibing the night before. We partied a little too hard. And the, the atmosphere got to Jamal, and he kind of fell out of the picture. <laughs> we have a question back here. So you've had all this success, and uh, everything's great. The product and the new car is fantastic. Uh, simply, you got this great team. What's next? Well, some of us are retired. It's going to be up to Raj. <laughs> Well, um, we're not done yet. We still have the road car to do. So for Jamal and me, there's a lot, a lot of work uh, um, on the, the road car still. And, and um, you know, th there's a lot of milestones in developing a vehicle. Um, and you don't want to miss any, but, you know, sometimes you do. But um, there's one that everyone will notice if you do, and that's job one. And so we're coming up on our job one milestone. Um, we committed to... Um, the FIA and all the governing bodies that we would be in production by the end of this year. So we've got a pretty hard milestone or we have to give some trophies back, which we don't want to do. So um, I think that's what's next on our, our plate. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of other programs going on in the company as well. It's a, it's a great time to be in product development with all the technology we're bringing to bear. But uh, for the GT team, it's, it's getting the road car ready and still racing and, and shooting for a couple of championships on, in WEC and IMSA. Yeah, so no pressure, Jamal, right? Um, pretty sure if we don't, if we don't do this, uh, I will be uh, probably outside in the lobby with my resume uh, looking for a new job. So every, everyone's, we absolutely, you know, we're committed. Uh, we need to deliver this car by the end of the year. So that's, uh, that's just you, about You've been through it doing. before, what, you know. We had to deliver cars one, two, three for the centennial. You can do this. We're wait, looking forward to it, and I know there's a lot of owners uh, going to be glad to get them. Any other questions? Oh, we spiked some interest here. I'll start here, and then I'll head over that way. I got several friends that placed orders, and they got the rejection letter. Do you? <laughs> and they want to know. This one's going straight to Raj. Yeah, so. They want to know, is there a chance they're going to get a car, or is it, you know, what, what's your advice on that? Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, we've announced that um, we're capable of building 250 a year, and we've announced two years of production, so that's 500 cars. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, we received over 6,000 
uh, applications. Um, and so, um, you know, a lot of, of great people. We did, you know, prioritize GT owners and, and Ford loyalists, um, but there's certainly a lot of very worthy people that we were not able to confirm um, production. So, um, I would say watch this space. Um, it's obviously more demand than we anticipated, um, and so we're working through that. Um, but certainly, it was a very humbling experience for us, um, the applications and, and really high quality applications and people, and clearly people that were extremely loyal to the company that we just simply did not have enough cars to, to satisfy. And um, yeah, watch the space. Any okay. Yeah. Any uh, thoughts on racing the open class and developing a car for that? Um, you know, certainly the, the overall win is always enticing. Um, but we're, you know, we're, obviously racing's in our blood. It's in our DNA. You, you guys that know Ford know that. Um, we're the only manufacturer that's, that's won every major series that exists around the world. Every, everything we've participated in, we've won at. Um, but it's also, uh, there's, there needs to be the right return. We do it for a reason. We do it for passion, but we also do it for the business. And the thing about um, the prototypes is they're in incredible machines, but um, they're very difficult to relate to what you actually see in the showroom or on the road, both in terms of their appearance, but also even the technology on them. Um, I mean, the hybrids that they're really running right now are not hybrid technologies that are really going to hit the road. And that's one of the great things about um, the new GT that, um, you know, the 3.5 EcoBoost is, is the basis of it is the 3.5 that's in production right now. Um, some of the active aerodynamics that we're working on are things that we're working on for production. Clearly the carbon fiber construction, we're, we're learning a lot and being able to bring that into broader use in the mainstream. And then obviously the car itself is the road car. And so people relating the road car to what it's capable of doing on the track. So we think that, you know, the GT is the right place for us to be. A, a lot of manufacturers are thinking that. There's a lot of competition coming into GT, whereas, uh, to be honest, the prototype class is, has got three guys right now, and two of them are from the same company. So um, I, I think it's a little difficult right now in, in prototype for that to make sense, that much investment, that type of technology for basically w one race. So. And I have to say, I, I agree, although I don't have a vote anymore. I, th I think they've messed things up by having these uh, prototypes that are literally hundreds of millions of dollars to campaign that, that bear no resemblance to anything that's going to be on the road. Last question. Uh, I, uh, I know that you, uh, one of you mentioned uh, Camillo Pardo's name in connection with the 06 car, and I know Camillo was a so-called designer or stylist. I'm not sure what the right term is there. Uh, who was the equivalent to Camilla? Who was the stylist or designer on the uh, new car? And why isn't he here today? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think the thing about design is Camilla was, was the chief designer and, um, you know, made a tremendous contribution, but it's always a team. This, you know, the thing about this business that most people don't realize is um, one success has many fathers, um, but it's such a team sport. Um, and, you know, the public and, and everyone wants to, to find a personality that's, you know, the father or whatever car. That's just not the way the business works. It is, it is the team that delivers a car. And uh, the sign of a great car is, is the sign of a great team. Um, and so, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of designers obviously involved in, in the car. Many of them were here at, at the earlier part of the show. I don't know if you saw Murray Callum and, and some of the other designers who were speaking today, but certainly Murray's the head of design, um, and Chris Svensson and Todd Willing, who's in, in Australia right now, uh, Gary Nicosian, uh, Kamal Kirk. I mean, there's many, many designers that, and I'm sure I'm leaving out a lot of the guys that were down there that had many of the individual desi uh, designs that ended up on, on the final production cars. So um, I, I would say it was, it was a great example of a one Ford team effort. And I don't know, Jamal, if you had anything to add to that. No, I mean, that, that's so true is that as, as uh, rom romantical of the you know, uh, idea of having 
one guy that is doing everything and is, you know, the, the brainchild. The reality is that there are a lot of people inputting and uh, I would, you know, and I think everyone here would rather a car have, you know, the brain power and the creative uh, power of a team of, you know, 40, 50 people behind it versus just one. Uh, and certainly, you know, the, this car. And, you know, what's amazing to me is this car, it, it was so, uh, it was very much an engineering project as well. And it was developed in a wind tunnel and in, uh, you know, in, in a CFD screen. And uh, I'm amazed that it turned out as beautiful as it did when you leave it up to, I mean, basically the engineers and the aerodynamics to, to uh, you know, dictate what the architecture and the, the master silhouette of the car is. And uh, I mean, it's not like that was planned. Uh, we would have, I think we would have done this car if it was the ugliest thing since, uh, well, ugly things, but, <laughs> But it would have been a harder beautiful. sell at the board, but yeah. Um, I, what Jamal said is so true that more than any of the program I've ever been involved with, particularly this aspect of developing the race car and road car at the same time, this, this car being developed on CFD, uh, in the wind tunnel, and in the studio at the same time, and the primary driver being, this is what the aerodynamics needs. And the way the engineers and, and designers work together, uh, for me, is... is an incredible template that we need to learn from for the rest of the company because it's often a little bit more sequential and the, the it, it's incredibly good car aerodynamically as far as drag and downforce and and the fact that it came out so beautiful as well is really a testament to the team all right let's uh let's thank our panelists i hope you enjoyed uh, the time with them they'll be here to answer any questions you have and uh, great job, guys. Thank you all for coming on. Good to see you all together again. And hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have a drink together or something. Thank you all. Thank you.